The American Civil War was the most polarizing event in the entire history of the United States, pitting brother against brother, countrymen against countrymen, Americans versus Americans, all in the name of slavery, or more accurately, how much slavery, and where. History textbooks have a habit of simplifying the Civil War, many times simply stating that it was good versus evil, right versus wrong, the righteous North finding end slavery while the wicked South fought to sustain it. But like everything in life, it wasn't as simple and black and white as they make it seem. Not all Southerners were wicked slave owners and not all Northerners were abolitionist activists, with many people living in the gray of the two. And probably one of the most important yet least known examples of this was free soilers. The free soil ideology was widespread across the northern union and out to the west, and for the majority of the time leaned up to and through the civil war, it was the most prominent belief, greater than that of the abolitionist movement. The dark truth was that much of the north didn't want to abolish slavery, rather limit it in the south, with it not only supported by common folk, but some of the highest ranking members of the government most notably future President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln. With this reality crushing the idealized view of the Civil War, many wish to let the topic of free soilers fade into obscurity, but it's vastly important to learn about it as it had a lasting impact on both the North and the South and the outcome of the Civil War. History classes nowadays have a way of painting or insinuating that the majority of the South had slaves and the North refused to keep slaves. But this is far from the truth. To begin with, the South had far less slaves than one would believe. In 1860, there was an estimated 6 million white men in the South, and only an estimated 300,000 of them actually owned slaves. With half of all slave owners in the South owning five or fewer slaves, it's a quite different reality from the idea that most Southerners were plantation owners. Another reality of the situation was that the North had many slaves as well. Now far less than those in the South, but they were still apparent in every single former colony in America. The harsh reality of the Atlantic slave trade was that North America was not the primary location for slaves. An estimated 10 to 12 million slaves were forcefully removed from Africa and sent to the New World. But only around 1 million of those total slaves reached the US, with the majority going to the Caribbean or South America. While the U.S. contained less slaves than the rest of the New World, they managed to build the vast majority of the South's economy on them. In the North, they were able to move past large amounts of slave labor as they turned from small-scale subsistence farming to an economy dominated by textiles and manufacturing. The South went the opposite direction, with their textile mill worth only an estimated $4.5 million compared to the $191 million they made off of King Cotton, they had moved so their sole focus was producing as much cotton as possible. This vastly influenced the South's belief of their superiority over their slaves and their place in American society. As their King Cotton provided 58% of the money America made from exporting in 1860, this was best expressed by South Carolina Senator James Henry Hammond saying, quote, You dare not to make war on cotton. No power on earth dares make war upon it. Cotton is king. End quote. In the years leading up to the Civil War, decisions made by the North would begin to alienate the South and their needs, resulting in the bloodiest war America had ever seen. This begins with the emerging movement of the Second Great Awakening. This movement saw the increase of religious enthusiasm throughout the country and created some form of awakening for many Christians. This awakening created many reform movements, and one of the most important calling for the abolishing of the slave system. But this belief went against much of what slave owners in the South believed. In their mind, not only did the Bible give support to slavery, they also had the believed in the concept of the peculiar institution, in which white Southerners believed that slaves were happy living and working for them as they received food and work from their white masters while also they never complained to them. Which, of course, slaves won't complain to their masters about their work or how they're treated, because that would have been an easy way for them to get punished or possibly killed by them. Another important set of events that continue to push the North and South farther apart comes after the acquisition of the West through the Mexican-American War and the Louisiana Purchase. 
This land acquisition brought to question the issue of what would become free land and what would become slave land. The Missouri Compromise of 1820 declared that land above the 3630 parallel would be free and below it would be slave land. But once Americans began to see the opportunities and riches located to the west, many northerners didn't want to give up some of it to the slaves, wanting to leave it open for white men pioneers. This idea of leaving the west and its opportunities open for white men and white men only was the foundation for the free soiler mentality. This led to the creation of the Wilmot Proviso, in which Congressman David Wilmot of Pennsylvania called for slavery not to be allowed to exist in the land received from the Mexican-American War, whether or not they were below or above the 3630 parallel. It's important to make the distinction that he and other free soilers didn't call for the dissolution of slaves in the southern slave states, rather than wish to contain it in that location and prevent it from spreading westward. The South was outraged by Wilmot as his declaration was a direct affront to their regional honor and a threat to their social and economic survival. Limiting slave owners' access to the West in their eyes was like tying a noose around their necks. The West was America's future and to prevent slave owners from moving west would cut off their lifeblood. The South and slave owners in the House of Representatives in an attempt to stop support of the free soil ideology and the abolitionist ones created the gag rule in 1836. The gag rule made it that all petitions regarding slavery would be tabled without being read, referred, or printed, preventing people from learning about the fears and hesitancies people had of slavery. But many people in the government were hesitant to take a strong stance on slavery and the West, unlike Wilmot did as they didn't want to alienate either section of the population, notably being President Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln, who was a smart politician, knew that if he had any chance of being staying in office, he would have to cater to both sides. When mentioning the future of slavery, Lincoln would say, quote, have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with slavery in the states where it exists. End quote. The Free Soiler Party would begin with the New York State Democrats when they left the state's Democratic Convention when the Wilmot Proviso was voted down. They abandoned the Democratic Party and decided to create their own in 1848, which would be rightfully named the Free Soil Party, in which the single issue they focused on being the prevention of expanding slavery. Their slogan was, quote, Free Soiler, Free Speech, Free Labor, and Free Men, end quote. They would run for president in the 1848 election, in which they would elect Martin Van Buren, the former 8th president of the United States, to represent their party. Not a wise choice as Van Buren had received the nickname Martin Van Ruin during his previous time in office. In the 1848 election, he would handily lose to the Whigs' Zachary Taylor for the presidency, but while Van Buren lost, the Free Soil Party had massive victories, earning 12 members into Congress and made the issue of slavery a central topic that hadn't been seen since the gag rule was created in 1836. But the party would reach setbacks due to the Compromise of 1850, in which, to try and calm the North and South, Congress would introduce the idea of popular sovereignty and the recapturing of escaped slaves. Soon following this, the Free Soil Party would rejoin the Democratic Party in 1854. During the onset of the South's succession and the beginning of the Civil War, both abolitionists and Free Soilers would side together and compromise on their beliefs to prevent the South's goal of spreading slavery across the country. The North wasn't the shining beacon of pure equality that modern historians try to make it seem. In reality, their war against slaveholding South was for selfish reasons. A key plan and opportunity to the West in control of white man, not slaves or slave owners. Free Soilers and their beliefs would go through many changes during the Civil War and the years following twisting them to seem similar to that of the abolitionists, but in truth, they had a much darker core. 